when we started working together in 2015 or like late 2014, 2015, the biggest thing that happened and the biggest differentiator between me failing those rope climbs in 2014 and us actually going winning the games in 2015, it was all mindset, you know. I was fit in 2014 and I was fit in 2015. It was my head that that made the difference and how much we had worked on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's something that, you know, it's out there and that we can all start learning and applying and we just believe it so much. Yeah. It's all out there. Everyone, I think everyone knows it all. It's just, do they believe it? What confidence is has nothing to do with winning or the leaderboard. What confidence is, is knowing that you giving your best effort is enough. All right, Ben. Um, special guest on today's episode. Uh, Katrin, Katrin and I just sat down, had a nice chat. Um, and before we get to that, I just kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit um, about one thing. Uh, recently on Instagram, you posted... Um, an image of, of your training together. And, and you said, um, s paraphrasing, but something along the lines of that you've learned more from her about being a champion than you could ever teach her. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought that that was really interesting uh, and really telling. And I'm curious what, what you meant by that. I'm curious sort of, should I have been surprised by that? I guess, first of all, and then, and then, why? Like, what What have you learned from her that that um, that made you say that? Um, I've learned everything that there is to, I don't should say everything there is. I've learned, a, I've seen a really firsthand account and kind of pulled the curtain back and seen what the daily rituals, practices, and routines are of a champion. You know, I can read about it. I can have my own thought process about it. I can research it. I can try and pull the best practices of other high achievers and have formulate my own opinions of what this looks like. But until you see it firsthand, you don't see that you don't, it, it's hard to kind of conceptualize what it looks like on a, on a day to day actionable level. You know, we have, I have this, a, a theory about, you know, what I want my athletes to look, act, and train, and compete like, yep. but it's just that it's a it's a theory, and it, you know it's you know we're not machines, and we're not just X's and O's and putting something into a program. You have to work with a whole bunch of different facets when you're talking about the human being that are variable and uncontrollable and emotional and so many different things. To see firsthand, as close as I am with Catherine, and we're incredibly close. She's almost a daughter to me. You know, I'm incredibly proud of our relationship. It's it's amazing to see truly what daily discipline looks like, mm -hmm. what true fortitude looks like, what true grit looks like, and all those characteristics that I like to talk about and I try to create and see them come full circle back. It's amazing that's that's where all the learning takes place for me. I can teach her my thoughts on these things, but actually but but seeing it happen, you know, ju it just reinforces the things that I'm giving to her and and really a lot of the stuff I'm giving to her is just pulling out what she's doing. Mm -hmm. She's already doing this stuff. I'm just kind of bringing it to the limelight and be like, this is what you do that makes you special. Interesting. Yeah. It's not a matter of like me saying like, you, we need to do it this way. This is who you were. This is what you were. And if you want to be something different, this is how you do it. It's very much like, this is how you become a champion. This yeah. is how you live your life. These are the guiding principles we need to live our life by going forward. Yeah. I have by far and away learned way more from Katrin than she, I believe she'll ever learn from me. Mm -hmm. One of the things we talked about um, when we sat down was the importance of having you there to sort of be um, the to be an sort of an unemotional um, part of of her process. You know, we talked about um, 
the fact that, you know, even she still will react maybe poorly to a bad workout, right? For mm -hmm. example. And to have you there as, as somebody who doesn't, who isn't wrapped up in the emotions of whether it's a bad workout, a bad day, a bad event, whatever. And having, having that sort of balance has been something that she's found to be really valuable. And I think that's, it's interesting when you say sort of what, what you just said, because it, it's, it just, it feels like you could, she could be a competitor without a coach. I mean, you can't be a coach without an athlete, but you, that, but you need that sort of that symbiotic relationship. Yeah. You need that balance. You need that give and take. Um, in order to, to really make each other better. And so I think that that's, I think uh, that yeah. that's a big, I think that's a big thing that until talking to you guys, I'm not sure I connected before. Yeah. I think it's uh, I think that, um, first off, that's, that's interesting that she picked up on that non-emotional part. We've never yeah. really talked about that. Yeah. Um, but I believe that's the role of the coach. I, I I'm, 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 excited that she picked up on that mm -hmm. i don't believe the coach is supposed to be the one that's on this you know when the, the coaches that i admire are the ones that are on the sidelines and they've got it together mm -hmm. you know they are not roll riding the emotional roller coaster they are not highs and lows i i'm a fan of bill belichick not pete carroll yep. that's the way you know i'm a big fan of john wooden not not bobby knight right. you know i'm very much a, a fan of um Brad Stevens, who's the coach of the Celtics right now, mm -hmm. former coach of Butler, youngest guy to bring teams to the Final Four. And there's this great footage of, it's the Elite Eight game, the winning team goes to the Final Four. And his team is down by one point with, with four seconds left. They inbound the ball and the guy catches it and travels. And the announcers are going crazy. The other sideline goes crazy. We've won, they've won the game. Mm -hmm. Him on Brad Stevens on the sidelines has his arms crossed, standing up, has his arms crossed, does no emotional facial expressions whatsoever. Just walks down the bench, points to next. What's the next best actionable thing I do? Yeah. Makes the appropriate substitution. Mm -hmm. Puts the next player in. The game's over though, right? The other yeah. team now has the ball with three seconds left, and they're up. So the game's over puts the right guy in, that guy steals the ball, they go down and he scores and wins. Best part, same, zero reaction. Mm. Arms stay crossed, he walks down the sidelines and shakes the hand of the opposing coach. <laughs> There's no, so the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. Yeah. He looks the same. Non-emotional. Yeah. Because emotions are not what's driving your best decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's the job of the coach. The athletes, in my opinion, it should not be emotional either. There mm -hmm. should be a fierce intensity. Mm -hmm. And we define what that is for our athletes. But the coach, if your coach is emotional, your athletes are going to ride that same wave of emotion, which can, to me, can't bring any good. Right. Right. All right. Cool. Let's get to the interview with Katrin. Okay, Katrin. Thank you so much for sitting down with us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're actually on the Cape where you guys mm -hmm. have... About to wrap up your training camp for the for the summer. Yeah, a little fight camp. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Love that. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you about a lot of things, but we're kind of use use this use the use Ben's book that just came out sort of as an uh, as an excuse to sit down with you because mm -hmm. you wrote a really uh, beautiful, wonderful introduction to this book, um, and so I wanted to start sort of with that introduction with a story from that introduction, um, and a lot of people know. Um, the story of the rope climbs in 2014, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of, when people talk about you, um, it always seems to begin there, which I think is funny because you were a games athlete before yeah. that. But we'll, we'll forget that for a second. It's, it, it starts with 2014 and the rope climbs that, um, in the, in, uh, at the regionals that you weren't able to do, you weren't able to go to the games. And the thing I wanted to ask you about first is, uh, something you mentioned in the book, which is that after that happened, you were friends with Ben, but you mm -hmm. certainly, you weren't his his athlete. And he sent you a text, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but it basically said, this could be the best thing that ever happened to you, mm -hmm. right? And so if you could maybe walk us through that story a little bit, yeah. um, what your response to it was, and then really how that began, uh, what is now uh, obviously a very fruitful relationship. Um. So yeah, it, it is funny because that's kind of where my story begins. 
is when I failed to qualify right. for my first CrossFit Games. Um, so I'd made it two years previous, and um, I was kind of – I guess there are a lot of these athletes that we love CrossFit, um, and I had a lot of other things that I was doing. I was coaching. Um, I was a full-time student, and I was trying to train for the CrossFit Games. And you kind of – when you're doing a lot of things, you end up doing a lot of things – okay. Yeah. And I go to the gym and I would check the boxes. I would do the work that was necessary and I would be good enough to make it to the CrossFit Games. And I could be a CrossFit Games athlete for the rest of the year. And I was content with that. And it wasn't really until I didn't make the CrossFit Games that I knew how badly I wanted to be there, how hard I wanted to work for it. And I didn't just want, when I, my first two years, when I got to the games, I didn't have any goals. I didn't, I was just happy to be there. Yeah. I honestly didn't even enjoy it because I was kind of overwhelmed once I got there. I didn't have a coach or a direction. I didn't really know how to handle the big scene. Um, so... After not making it, um, I'd been up to see if any, I'd probably known Ben for a couple months. I'd, um, I'd come up before the those regionals and I'd done like a regionals training camp with his athletes, um, with his team and with the athletes that he had at the time, which was Becca Voigt, Chris Beeler, Michelle LaTondra. Um, and I didn't make the games and I got a text from him saying that, you know, this could be the best thing that ever happened to me. And at the time, all I wanted to do was make the games. I was so mad. <laughs> <laughs> and like the response, I didn't give him a response for yeah. like 10, it must have been like 10 days, at least yeah. a week. Because I couldn't understand how that could be good. Mm -hmm. You know, like the only thing that I wanted that summer, I only wanted to train for the games. I only wanted to go to the games. And I had failed to qualify and I couldn't see what could possibly be good um so I did like after that I I took took a break a little bit I must have taken probably like a week off and I went on vacation I haven't been on family vacation for years yeah. um so I went with my dad and my siblings um to Morocco and I still can't remember how it came about or if it was random or not, but I read um, Michael Johnson's biography. The and, Splinter. Yep. yep. And he was supposed to win, or I mean, he'd been the best. He had, he had won every single race in the 100 and 200 leading up to the 92 Olympics. And he kind of describes it, how when he got to, you know, he describes his races very thoroughly. Like, it could be a whole chapter about a hundred meter race, which took him under t 10 seconds, right. <laughs> which is very, it's like what he's thinking, what's the thought process, what, what he's focusing on. And he would always be like the dry face. He'd be looking down and then he'd be like, after about like 60, like 40 meters, he'd start like looking up after 60 meters should always do like a right left. And he would be so like in the corner of his eyes, he could never see anyone because he was so far ahead. <laughs> right. And he gets, um, like a stomach bug or something leading up to, the games and he was in already in his tapering period so he was doing lighter loads he wasn't going as fast he wasn't trying to put out the same power output so i guess he didn't realize that he was losing strength and power yep um so when he gets to the games suddenly he like he describes the same race and he does his right left and everyone's there and he doesn't understand what's happening and he doesn't even make the finals which is for him a huge failure yeah. um he comes back in 96, he wins gold in 100, 200, and adds 400. Mm -hmm. And I think it was just I read it in the right time. And I read that instead of me being able to tell myself that I had, not that I'd failed, but that I was a failure or that I didn't belong or that I wasn't as good as them or that I couldn't be there or compete with them. Those are, that's all such an easy thing to fall into. And instead it was like, I had failed in that event and I had failed to qualify, but that in no way defined me. Mm -hmm. And that in, I was, 
It showed me that failure isn't a destination and you can move past it. And it sometimes, and like in my instance, was such a crucial part of a later success. I don't think I ever would have won the games without having failed in 2014, Mm -hmm. you know? So I read that and then I started reading sports psychology. And once I got back from that vacation, I started training again. And when everyone else had finished the games, and I remember after that summer, it was hard for me to train Mm -hmm. because I felt like I was going to the gym and I was just training. But other people were going to the gym and they were training for the CrossFit Games. And that sucked. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I remember waking up after the 2014 games and it was like a million pounds were off my chest. Yeah. It was a clean slate. Yeah, because everybody was now training for the next year. No one had made it to the CrossFit Games. (laughs) Right. And we were all in the same boat again, except... Everyone else was recovering for the games, and I was ready to go. Mm-hmm. I go to another training camp with Ben. It must have been that August or September. Um, and that's kind of when we more started working together. And that's when I remember I. everyone was always telling me that Ben only has these athletes. Like Ben doesn't take on any more athletes. And I remember, like, I was just about to go back home to Iceland, and... I loved working with Ben and I loved being at CFNE. I loved the environment. I loved who I was there. I loved how much everyone works so hard there and it's so positive. It's it's a great environment. It really is. And it kept me like always coming back for more, but I wanted I wanted Ben to be my coach. So I remember I I was like I can ask him to be my coach and either he'll say no and I'll just still have no coach or he'll say yes and I'll have a coach. Yeah. yeah. So that really worked no, out very no well. No there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was at the same time. I started reading um, The Champion's Mind. Yep. Um, at the same time, I was kind of started working with Ben and he would talk to me about, you know, what we should be focusing on, what we should not be focusing on, um, our thought process, our mindset, our approach to training, life, everything, and kind of like me reading it, working with him. And I was so hungry to learn and just become better. And it was never about winning the CrossFit Games never even crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. It was just every day. I just loved every day. I loved becoming better. Um, It just kind of all clicked. Mm -hmm. And I think I really, I started working with Ben at, the exact right time. Like I needed to have that failure Mm -hmm. um, in order for it to go in that direction. So working with him and moving across the world (laughs) is sort of, they're they're two different things because he works with athletes who, you know, broke and cold, they don't live here. Matt doesn't live here. You're the Mm -hmm. only one who moved here. Was that a was that a hard thing to to pick up your life and move it across the ocean, or was that did that feel like um, that's what that's what I do? That's what I'm going to do. Both. Yeah. I I always am so lucky with what it is now. I have a family here, yep. the Bergerons, and then my family and friends back home. I have these two. It's one life, but you know these two wonderful worlds which is, it's hard to leave one or the other. So it's kind of, it's, I'm just extremely lucky, you know? Um, But it kind of happened gradually. So I'd just keep, I'd come for four week training camps and then I'd come for eight week training camps and then I'd just start coming more frequently. And I just started, every time I would train at CFNE with Ben coaching me, it's totally different than getting programming. Yep. It's, I know that I can, you know, back home, I would train with Annie every day. Um, I can train well wherever. 
and I can get in, I don't know what I want to say, like 90 or 95% training day. Like I, I could still give high fives and it's, it was a good training day, but work, but having Ben coaching me and being at CFNE is every day is a hundred percent. And being able to give something a hundred percent. Um, we actually just listened to a podcast on the way here. Um, Liar Bird said that if you give everything a hundred percent, somehow things will end up well, mm-hmm. or like line up well. It was something in that direction. And it really does. When you if you can stand on the starting mat at the CrossFit Games and know that we gave a hundred percent into every training day. And then you go give it 100% in the games. You're going to be happy at the end of it all. No matter what. There's no regrets. And that's kind of like to be able to make adjustments on the fly. And take feedback and apply it right away. It's it's 100% every single day. So I was going to say like at first uh, it is hard. And I miss home. And I yeah. miss my family. I miss my friends. And um, but I remember like making the decision to quit school or put school on hold, um, and quit coaching to pursue this hundred percent. And I remember like talking to my grandma about it. It's like, it was, it's always hard to leave, but mm-hmm. we always said, and I mean, I talked so much to my mom and my dad and all my friends back home. It's like, we are always together. And I remember having the conversation with my grandma. She's like, you know what? We're doing this right now. You know, like school will wait. Yep. And if I want to do coaching, that will wait too. It's like, this is what we're doing right now. And even if we're all in different countries, like we're all in this together. Mm-hmm. And for now, this is the best place for me to be. Like to be in Boston, I've created an environment that it's so focused and it's so dialed in. You can, after every season, we can walk away with a head out tie and know that we didn't leave any stones unturned, you know? So you say a hundred percent. And I think a lot of people feel like they go a hundred percent at something. I feel like that's a, it's almost a cliche, you mm-hmm. know, like I gave this a hundred percent, but I'm really curious how, how you define a hundred percent in, in training and in competition like what does that actually mm-hmm. look like and maybe what does that look like as a versus or as opposed to what maybe most people think a hundred percent is mm-hmm. that makes sense it, like do yeah. you know that can yeah you, like i know exactly what you because mean. I, my guess is that before 2014 you thought you knew what a hundred percent is but now knowing what's the last couple of years that's been redefined for you is that right no, um, I actually, I don't think if you would have asked me back then if I was doing everything that I could, I, or honestly don't know. I, I've, I've always been a hard worker. Mm-hmm. I've always worked hard and I've known that I was a hard worker, but there's a big difference between working hard and working really, really hard. <laughs> yes. And that's the hundred percent that I'm talking about. Yeah. And I honestly think if you'd ask people how hard they work, I, I bet they'd say hard, but I don't think people can say they work very, very hard all the time. Or maybe, they, I don't know, but I am very critical of myself and I ask myself multiple times and it's not just, I ask myself during a workout, I ask myself, you know, during lifts, I want to use every single lift. Every single lift is an opportunity to become better. I'm not trying to finish the next three lifts. I'm using the next three lifts to become better. Um, in a workout, you can go hard and you can make it hard or you can pace it out so perfectly that it's hard the whole time and you give it just the oomph at the end that you need to finish every single ounce of energy that you have left. And there's a time and place for everything. Sometimes I think the 100% people think, do more, do more, do more. Sometimes Ben might tell me, this is enough for today. And that's my 100%. You know, I'm going to put myself in a deficit if I do more. Um, And the same with like volume versus intensity. It's such a fine line. And that's why it works so well with me and Ben. 
I don't know these things. Mm-hmm. I just want to keep working. Right. I just want to do more and more and yeah. more. Yeah, he said that part, a big part of his job is to get you to stop. <laughs> that, yes, that yeah. is. So for me, I would trust him with everything and anything. And I know that what he tells me to do is the best thing to do. And that's kind of the beauty of it all. Because I know that what he tells me to do, I will do as well as I possibly can. I will give it everything that I have. And if he tells me to stop, I will stop. And if he tells me to do something, I will do it really well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, I wouldn't know what to do by myself. I don't know what's enough or when I should be going with. I'll ask him before a workout, you know, what is the stimulus of this workout? Sometimes he'll tell me, I don't want you sprawled out on the floor. Like he wants me to do things more like, Myth, I don't know, methodically. Mm-hmm. Yep. And like, don't put yourself in a deficit. Maybe this is more an active recovery. Now it's like, okay, I really want you to go. Um, there's different things to it all. But it's, uh, and I'm still learning. I don't know what my 100% is, but I'll work very hard to get there. And I'll try as hard as I can every day to make sure that when I ask myself the question, am I working as hard as I can? I want to be able to say yes. Mm-hmm. But I do, it's probably one of the things that I doubt the most. It's one of those things that I never want to feel like like I'm there or I want to be the hardest worker, but I like thinking that someone else is working harder mm-hmm. and it makes me want to chase them. Mm-hmm. Do you still, do you still, I mean, maybe it's a silly question, but do you still feel like you have bad days? Days that you, you know, you crawl into bed and you're like, uh, that didn't work today or, or um, I wasn't in it or I didn't give it 100% or have you guys got to a place where those days are really, really rare? You know what? Um, our bad days are our best days. Like we tell the stories and the, like there was a workout. Um, I feel like when you fail or... I'm not going to say fail, but when you do something wrong in training, when you're tired or something is going wrong or not like you want to, and what you can definitely look at and be like, like, this is terrible or this is not, this is a wasted training day or whatever. Those are the days that you can learn. Mm -hmm. Those are the days that you can grow. If everything is just going great and happy go lucky, yeah, it's more fun. But you're not grown as much. Mm-hmm. And what if what if one of those bad days hit you in a competition? Do you know how to handle it? The more of those bad things that happen to you in training is awesome. Mm-hmm. I had a terrible, or I thought that I had a terrible um, training day. We were doing a workout that um, over at Squats and Muscle Ups at the Cape last year, um, which is... Cole was cruising through it, doing great. And those are movements that are harder for me. And I felt like it was coming up close to the games. Um, I was being very judgmental of how I was doing. And I didn't like how my muscle-ups were going. And I didn't think they were good enough. And um, <clears throat> so I kind of just like, I just walk outside after the workout. Um, and I felt like it was terrible. It was horrible. And it was a bad training day, and suddenly I was like, we're not in the right place. We're not where we want to be. Yeah. And that's when, like, Ben came out, and he was like, this is awesome, you know? That I now had the opportunity to, number one, I had the opportunity to learn how to flip the page. I had the opportunity to learn um, that I will get workouts that are hard for me. These workouts are going to show up at the CrossFit Games. Right. I'm not going to go win every single workout at the CrossFit Games. And these workouts are going to show up. And I can either have that mindset or I can continue to work as hard as I can through them. I could learn that. And there were workouts that I would, at the CrossFit Games, be going back like, okay, how should I have handled that workout? Yep. You know. So that's that was one of our favorite training days. One that I walked out, was unhappy wouldn't surprise me there were a couple of tears <laughs> <laughs> you know but our bad days are our best days they so happen and we learn what is the mechanism that you use 
to learn from those days? Because I think you said something really interesting, which um, is sort of that, like, if everything's going great, Mm -hmm. then you're probably not getting better Mm -hmm. to a degree, right? Like, you need those bad days. You might be getting better, but... Yeah, I see. But you're not growing. And you're not... When the adversity hits, are you strong enough? And have you gone through enough to know how to handle it at that point? Mm -hmm. So, like... So, again, how do you process those days? Is it... Mm -hmm. Or those moments? Like, is it, like, literally you just sit down at the end of the night or, you know, at the end of the day and think, okay, (laughs) I did that, that, and that wrong? Or, like, what is, like, literally what is the I'm letting out my secret. It's all all Ben. It's (laughs) all Ben. I sit there and I sit there and I want to cry. And he'll come up and he'll be like, he'll be like, okay, let's talk about this. And he can turn my mind. Okay. Yeah. So that's interesting to me in that there's – he is removed from the emotion of it to the point where he can look at it mm-hmm. in a more holistic or a, or a, or a more um, sort of uh, like kind of from the outside, not exactly. judging it as yeah, much. Yeah, exactly. So you say that you say that that's necessary and that's important for mm-hmm. you, and I think that's clearly that's working. And what I'm really curious about is it feels to me that that's still the minority in the sport of CrossFit, where Athletes at the games have somebody whose job it is is to remain in passion um, and to look at look at the big picture and not look at the the moment to moment stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously he does that, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Do you think that? Do you think a big part of your success is that you found somebody to fill that role when other people don't feel like it's necessary, or? Did you guys just kind of, is this just working and it works for some people and it doesn't work for other people? Um, I honestly don't have an answer for that. Yeah. This works for us. Right. You know, um, our relationship works and we work together almost every single day of the year and he knows me in workouts. He knows how I react. Um, he knows if I'm reacting a certain way, what kind of mindset I am in and then how to turn that um so like I I just know what works for me and it's not the same for everyone yeah and what works for me isn't going to be for everyone else um but like I say I kind of feel like we started to work together at the right time um where I was just I was ready to learn and I was willing to work a lot and learn a lot from him. He does a lot where he, he leads by example. I think that's probably the first, what kept me coming back for more. It wasn't, he's not just saying empty words. He says Mm -hmm. words that he lives by and that work. And that whole first year of us working together, we would, when we talk about our mindset or our approach to training and competition and life, it's like, you're kind of hopping into it blindly. Like he would tell me what he believed and I would trust it 100%. And I would just do it as well as I could. And kind of like when we then won in 2015, that kind of validated it all. You know, it's kind of like, okay, like this really does work. And then you just continue to learn and you continue to try and grow. And it's not we haven't figured everything out or there's so much to grow. It just validates the path that you're on and just Mm -hmm. to continue to grow. And I think that's the beauty of it all, that there is so much room to grow. There really is. Mm -hmm. It's like, like we say, like right now, I feel great. I'm so excited for the games and we've prepared very well. And I feel like, we're ready for the games, but at the same time, we're not like ready. We're not a finished product. Like, oh my gosh, I, I could tell you everything that we're still working on and all the progressions that we can keep on doing and keep on getting better at. There's, that's what keeps me coming back for more. Yeah. It's. How important have you found it to be? So one of the things that I think is really interesting you know, that you've said about being at New England, being with Ben. I know that you're super close with the Bergerons as, mm-hmm. as a family. How important have you found it in your 
sort of in your experience to surround yourself with people who make you better and better can be however you define better because yeah. each person is going to make you better in a different way. But how, how important has that element been literally just surrounding yourself with the people that you've surrounded yourself with in, in terms of how much you've been able to progress over the last three or four years or whatever it's been? Um, it's everything. You are who you surround yourself with. Um, you really are. You're the mindset of the people around you. You're, um, you're the energy of the people around you. Um, the habits, everything. Um, you choose who you surround yourself with. It's, it's all a choice. Yeah. And I, not a day goes by that I don't think about how lucky I am with the people that I have around me. You know, my mom, my dad, my grandpa, the 23 years that I had with my grandma, my siblings, my best friends, the Bergerons. It's like the whole, like, I'm very, very lucky. Mm -hmm. And I hope everyone can feel that way. And like you say, like everyone kind of participates like in a different aspect of like making you better in some way. Yep. But if someone's not making you better, if someone's bringing negative energy to your life or not making you happy or something, you don't have to associate yourself with them. You don't have to spend your time with them and make yourself feel worse. I think um, it was Michael Kazu posted this mm -hmm. about a D or it was a D about Michael. They were both very cute with posting about each other. <laughs> but they were saying that you don't um, fall in love with people. You fall in love with who you are with certain people. Mm -hmm. And that could be a partner or friends or yep. whatever that is. But I read it and I was like, that's so true. It's not necessarily always like, I don't think it's a, it's necessarily the people, it's, the, it's who you are mm -hmm. together and who you are yep. with them and who, like what they bring out in you. And I think that's the most important about the people around it. Like who do they bring out in you? Is that who you want to be? Are you becoming, are you closer to who you want to become? And those are big things. Um, in a previous podcast, I think the, I don't remember what number it is, but uh, we were, Ben and I were talking about this <laughs> month and this sort of this mm -hmm. training camp and having you and Brooke and Cole all in the same place at the same time. And I, and I asked a question that I thought he was gonna answer differently. Hmm. And my question was, is the is the dream sort of recreating this environment year round, right? Like having you and Brooke and Cole and everybody in the same place all of the time. Mm -hmm. And he, and so I thought, just not knowing anything, I thought like, of course, that has to be better. It's got to be good. If it's good for thirty days, it must be good for three hundred and thirty days. But his answer was no, that it's not ideal because he wasn't sure that you and i don't know that he was speaking specifically about you but just having athletes at your caliber com being in the same the, the gym at the same time all the time mm -hmm. would you guys would sort of run yourself ragged mm -hmm. right you'd always yeah. be um you'd always be competing even when you're not competing yeah right and so it's interesting to me to think about like what the future of the sport looks like if we can assume to some degree that it, it's got to look similar to what you and Ben have figured out, mm -hmm. right? Being in the same place at the same time, day in and day out, working together, one person thinking about it differently than the other person. But I don't like that. How do, I don't, there aren't that many coaches. There aren't that many Ben's there aren't. So I'm just curious how you see the sport continuing to grow because people are gonna look at what you're doing and they're gonna to try to replicate it. But if it's not the case that you can put Brooke here and two other athletes and you get better, like then it, I'm, just, I'm just curious what you think about what it looks like if it's not that, if it's not like everybody lives together in a house I mean, and trains together. It's not like there aren't more coaches than there mm -hmm. are more athletes. I mean, in 2015, I came into the games as someone who hadn't even made it the previous year before. 
no one is expecting me to go yeah. win the games at the same time as like there are probably tons of athletes right now that are shooting up and tons of coaches right now that are shooting up. Mm -hmm. We just don't know about them, right? right? Or know about them yet. Yep. At the same time as like, if it works for us to work together, maybe someone else to find a coach athlete relationship will work just as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I really don't know. I think it's just going to continue to grow. And if you look at where we were, I mean, when I started at the end of 2011, I just started CrossFit and I made it right away to the CrossFit Games. Yeah. Like that would never happen now. Correct. You know, <laughs> people yeah. can't just enter the sport and make the CrossFit Games. You yeah. got to train for this year. And you can't even really, it's not even a hobby anymore. People do this all year round as their job. Yep. Um, so it's already grown so much. And the same with like, Coaches used to be more just like programmers and throw programming out there. And now, I mean, maybe it works for some people, but at least for me, it it's the best thing that I can come and I can work with Ben every single day. And I have a coach. Um, I, don't, I can only see it getting bigger and better. And once we know more, I think we still know so little. Mm, interesting. You know? Yeah. Like how it's not a, many years ago that people thought you can't run a five minute mile and Correct. squat 500 yeah. pounds. And that's now true. that's kind of like, I'm not going to say everyone can do that, but a right. lot of people can do that now. Yeah. And I think we're just going to continue breaking barriers. And it's not like we're going to come very good at endurance that we can't become strong. Like we're going to come, everything's going to start lifting up. I think, do you remember the three minute Fran thing? Like yeah. you were legit. If you do a three minute Fran and you just had to make that, yep. like, everyone <laughs> can do that now yes you know if you're at the crossfit games you're yeah. trying to break the two minute barrier yeah. that's like 30 mm percent -hmm. it's like it's getting everyone is getting so much better mm -hmm. like the lifts are getting better the fitness is getting better the endurance is getting better everything is getting better and i think it's just going to continue to rise when once we know more and once we've had more time in this sport mm -hmm. Do you think that a lot of, do you, or how much of that improvement or that potential improvement do you see happening um, physically versus mentally? In other words, how much of that growth do you think is because we, the science helps or the training gets mm -hmm. tweaked? And how much of that is people um, understanding the stuff that Ben talks about in this book and the stuff that you guys talk about every day? Where do you see that the sort of the needle on uh, the importance of or the the reliance on either one of those? Um, both, and I think it's totally. I think they're totally different questions. Number one, yes, we're going to continue to get physically better, but at the same time as when we started working together in 2015 or like late to 2014, 2015, the biggest thing that happened and the biggest differentiator which, between me failing those rope climbs in 2014 and us actually going winning the games in 2015 it was all mindset yeah you know i was fit in 2014 and i was fit in 2015 it was my head that that made the difference and how much we had worked on that mm -hmm. um so i think that's something that you know it's out there and that we can all start learning and applying and we just believe it so much. Yeah. It's all out there. Everyone, I think everyone knows it all. It's just, do they believe it? Mm -hmm. And what works for each individual? Like we're all so different. Um, so I think for everyone, there's, there's so much room to grow in both areas, but they're totally different areas. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. One of the things that I was thinking about when when I was reading the book was that sort of similar to what you just said is like all of this stuff, is, you know, it's, it's out there, right? Mm -hmm. You can find it. Sports psychology is not mm -hmm. a new field, yeah. right? It's been around. And the thing that struck me was there is a huge gap between sort of knowing it and doing it. Right? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting that you put it as like the believing it. That's what I mean. Like, mm -hmm. that's how you, that's interesting because I didn't think that that's the key. Like, for me, it was like, you've got to, you know, you have to dedicate yourself to it or like you've got to find yeah. a, a method that works. But, but you're right. Believing it, believing in it yeah. is the first step. 
believing that it is the thing that can move yeah. the needle for you is the first step of figuring out how to implement it or how to uh, put it into a daily practice. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Did you did you always believe in it, or or did? I mean, I guess I guess you sort of answered that a little bit in terms of you know, that break after not making it to the games? Um, honestly, I didn't know about it. Yeah. I didn't know that everyone wants to get stronger, to have bigger lifts. Everyone wants a faster mile time. Everyone wants to know how their pull-ups and thrusters are paired together, all of that. Um, but what Ben does is that he focuses on our – character first and foremost and then he wants certain characters that will follow a certain process that's what we call the process mm -hmm. that then will lead to results that then will lead to better mile times that then will lead to better a bigger snatch or bigger clean or whatever that is um and i know it it doesn't seem like it fits like, it seems like the mindset and the character and who you are is going to lead to a faster mile time. But it really does. And it, it does work. It just takes a certain character to follow a certain process that will lead to the faster mile time or mm -hmm. the bigger clean or whatever that is. Um, so honestly, I did not know about any sports psychology or anything back then. I didn't know there was a good or a bad mindset. I just knew that I was competitive and driven, yeah. but that's so totally different, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but once I started reading those things, once I started working with Ben, I believed in it fully. I committed to it fully. Um, so I think once I knew, that's something that I really, really went with. Um, yeah. I think that is a good place to, to end it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, of course. <laughs>